Hello and uh, welcome to the first uh, guest speaker lecture in the fourth edition of the CILE Academy. Uh, we are delighted to have today with us Professor Matthias Forto, uh, who's a very dear colleague and a very dear friend. Um, and uh, we are delighted to have you, Matthias, uh, with us today. Uh, we are starting this week the academy. We are dealing with the topic of international lawmaking. And uh, Professor Matthias Forteau, who is a professor of international law at the Nanterre University in Paris, in France, also a member of uh, the International Law Commission. He has just been appointed a special rapporteur on the topic of non-legally binding agreements, although it might be instruments, I'm not sure. We will maybe change the title, but he will maybe tell us. Uh, but he's also a very experienced uh, practitioner uh, since he has appeared before the International Court of Justice, uh, the International Tribunal on the Law of the Sea, and different arbitral tribunals as counsel for several states. So we are delighted to have you, Matthias, uh, with us on behalf of uh, Nilofer, uh, who I'm not sure who will if she will join us today or not, but on behalf of Nilofer Oral and myself, a warm welcome to you to the Academy. And we're looking forward to your presentation, uh, which will be followed, though we do have Nilofer. I just uh, saw her, spotted her, and so really happy to see you too. Um, I don't know if you're in a condition to speak or not, uh, but okay, just uh, just to say hi. Um, and uh, we um, uh, will have a presentation by Professor Porto, uh, and then uh, uh, the participants will be able to uh, ask questions, make comments, uh, either on the chat uh, uh, or um, live uh, with their mics and cameras on. So, uh, Matthias, again, thank you so much for having accepted uh, our invitation. We're delighted to have you here with us, and the floor is all yours. Many thanks, dear Patricia. It's a real pleasure to be here today with you for this conference on the international lawmaking in the 21st century. And of course, I will start by expressing my sincere thanks to the organizers of this academy for their invitation to present this lecture and for the great opportunity to have an exchange of views with you and I hope uh, lively debates on this uh, very important topic, international lawmaking in the 21st century. Well, to be totally honest with you, uh, at first sight, when I was invited uh, to present this lecture, uh, it, did, it did not sound very attractive uh, because there is nothing more uh, classical, more orthodox than the presentation of the sources of international law, that is to say the method of formation of international law. Uh, indeed, when we study or when we teach international law, this is usually the very first topic that is addressed. And for instance, in my university, uh, this is a course uh, that is mandatory for all second grade students. And this is a course where we present the law of treaties, the law of customary international law, general principles of law, uh, nothing which is at first sight uh, very uh, exciting because this is again very classical and this is the start of any study of international law. Uh, at first sight also, it uh, doesn't sound very attractive because we are here on very safe grounds because as you know, we have Article 38 of the Statute of the International Court of Justice uh, which is quoted in any international law handbook and which proposes a list of sources of international law and each of them treaties, customary international law, general principles of law, again, are very well known of international lawyers and they are part of the day-to-day -day practice of international law. So in a way, uh, the sources of the method of formation of international law are uh, the very basic toolbox of international lawyers. So one may ask why in October 2023, uh, should we have a lecture on international law making? What's new under the sun? Uh, would it sound sensible, for instance, for domestic lawyers to challenge today's sources of domestic law? And why should international lawyers uh, have to do it for international law? 
Well, as I will try to, to argue this afternoon, there are very good reasons to do so in international law in the specific context of the 21st century. We are no longer in 1919 or in 1945 when the League of Nations was created or when the UN was created, when Article 38 of the Statute of the Permanent Court of International Justice and then the Statute of the ICJ were adopted. Since 1945, new challenges, challenges arose, new legal needs appear, and then we must address the question of whether or not the method of formation of international law that emerged centuries ago are still well suited to confront the 21st century challenges. And to address this question, and at least to propose some uh, personal thoughts on that topic, I will try to address three points this afternoon. First, the first question to address is to determine if we actually need today more international rules, and we need to address if the formation of new international rules is the challenge that really matters today. That will be my first question. Do we need more international law and do we need to address the method of formation of international law? My second question, the second point that I will address, if the answer to the first question is yes, then the other question is, do we need new forms of instruments beyond the classical method of formation of international law do we need new instruments to foster and to strengthen international cooperation? And my third question will be, are the method of international law, the method of formation of international law, democratic enough? And which improvements could be made in the formation of international law to have something which is more inclusive in the formation of international? So these will be the three points that I will try to address this afternoon in this uh, lecture. And so I will start with my first question. Is making new international law the most important issue today? It's not obvious, in fact, that the main challenge today is to adopt new rules of international law or to accumulate new treaties or new customary rules or to spend too much time on discussing the method of formation of international. And this is so for two reasons. First, we already have a great number of international rules. If you take a look to the number of treaties that are published by the UN, uh, by the UN uh, treaty section, you can see that there are a great number of treaties concluding every day by states. To take just one example, my country, France, concludes on average, approximately 300 to 400 treaties each year. So we have a lot of treaties already uh, existing. We already have a lot of customer international rules in many fields of international law. And we have many, many resolutions, declarations adopted by international organizations or by international conferences. So in fact, we already have plenty of international rules. Second point, there is no crisis in the formations of international law. Some people think that there are crises, for instance, in the multilateral uh, uh, level of formation of international law. Multilateralism will be in crisis as regards formation of international law. To some extent, this is true because we have negotiations, protracted negotiations on some topic where we need new treaties. Uh, for instance, if you take the agenda of the Sixth Committee of the United Nations General Assembly, the committee in charge of legal matters, you have for many years negotiations uh, which uh, go nowhere on, for instance, uh, the Framework Convention on Terrorism, uh, negotiations on uh, corporation and business entities and human rights. You have negotiations in Geneva. 
uh, more recently negotiations on the Convention on the Crimes Against Humanity, or the negotiations perhaps uh, that will be uh, put before uh, a conference on protection and prevention of uh, protection of persons in the event of disasters. So we have at the agenda of the international community some uh, negotiations for mutual treaties that uh, do not succeed so far. But at the same time, we also assisted in the recent years to great successes in the matter of formation of uh, multilateral conventions. Uh, for instance, last June uh, was adopted at the UN the, the uh, Conventions on BBNJ, uh, Protection of Biodiversity Beyond National Jurisdiction, which was a real success for the United Nation. We are also negotiating, and it will be adopted, no doubt, uh, the Treaty on the Plastic Pollution, for instance. And there are also uh, ongoing negotiations that will have to end by next year uh, in Geneva on pandemics and international law. prevention and preparedness with regard to pandemics in international law. So, in a way, multilateralism still uh, works in international law, and there is no worries to have even if for some topic, of course, we uh, have to be more ambitious and try to, to uh, conclude some negotiations. Besides, if you take a look to the case laws, to the docket, for instance, of the ICG or the IT laws, you may see that multilateral conventions are at the core of existing uh, judicial practice of court and tribunals. And very important conventions, such as the genocide conventions, such as the conventions against racial discrimination, or the Convention Against Torture, you have important cases uh, nowadays before the ICJ, which, has, which uh, are based on this convention. So it means that classical method of formation of international law, multilateral conventions are still very important today on the day-to-day -day practice of international, uh, international lawyers. And if we uh, uh, take the example of a conflict today in Palestine uh, and Israel, of course, the Geneva Conventions on the law of armed conflicts will be very important in, in this conflict. So there is no real crisis in the formation of international. And uh, in that respect, what matters today are not, is not necessarily to challenge the method of formation of international law, but there are other challenges which are as important as the question of formation of international law. And in my view, there are in particular four challenges which are important and which are in a way, as I will explain, linked to the issue of formation of international law. The first issue, which is very important, is the application of rules of international law. It's not necessary or not very healthy to accumulate rules of international law to form new rules of international law if there is no compliance with the existing rules of international law. So there is a need to assess together formation of international law and compliance with international law. This is my first, my first uh, challenge. Two, we need to have strong rules on interpretation of rules of international law. Because if we, again, accumulate rules of international law, but there is dispute between states on the interpretation of the existing rule of international law, that cannot work. Uh, from that perspective, uh, for your generations, perhaps, Article 31 to 33 to the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, which set forth the rules for interpretation of treaties, may be seen as something very uh, normal, not surprising, very classical. But in fact, it was a great victory in 1969 to incorporate in the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties rules on interpretation. Because it means that when you have a dispute between two or more states on interpretation, now we have clear rule for the interpretation of treaties. So there is no room for disagreement on the method of interpretation of international law, since we have now Article 31 to 33 of the Conventions on the Law of Treaties. And this is something which is still very important when we practice international law. And of course, it has some repercussions on the formation of international law. 
because to be sure that you can interpret uh, correctly rules of international law, that you can settle dispute on interpretation of international law, it means, it means that the drafters of rules of international law, when you form new rules of international law, are to be aware of the need to draw very clear rules, are to be aware of the need to anticipate the problem of interpretation of the rules that they are adopting. So here again, interpretation of international law and formation of international law are to be seen as coming together. The third challenge is to find better ways to identify existing rule of international law. Again, it's a one thing to adopt new rules, to accumulate new rules of international law, but then you need to identify what is existing as a matter of international. And this is a real challenge today. And I will take just a few examples. My first example is the two ongoing pending uh, advisory proceedings before the ITLOS, the Terminal for the Law of the Sea, and before the ICJ. These two advisory proceedings are about climate change and international. And what is interesting in these two advisory proceedings are the questions which are submitted to these two tribunals. The question put before the ITLOS is, what are, what are the specific obligations of set parties to so the UNCLOS regarding climate change? So the question is about identification of the existing obligation. The same question is put before the ICJ in the climate change case. The question is, again, what are the obligations of states under international law to ensure the protection of the climate system? I think this is very interesting. It means that you have states concluding a lot of treaties, uh, adopting many rules of international law on climate change, and then you have a case before the ITLOS and the ICJ where the question is, tell us what are the obligations that were concluded by states. It means that in the current practice of international law, you have so many rules of international law, so many instruments of international law, that today the main issue in, in many cases is not to apply this or that treaty, but to identify what states are obliged to do under international law. This is a very interesting trend. We had the same issue before the International Law Commission with at least two topics. The first one was a topic on identification of customer international law. We know that there are customer international rules, but we need to have a methodology to identify customer international law. And it was a very important topic for the commission, which was uh, finally concluded in 2018. We have the exact same kind of topic today uh, at the agenda of the commission with the topic on general principles of law, where the issue is to try to identify what are general principles of law and how you can identify the content of these general principles of law. So again, this is a very important issue today in the day-to-day -day practice of court and tribunals, of the ILC, of practitioners, you may have many rules already existing, but then you need to identify what these rules are saying and which obligation apply in each specific case. The fourth challenge, and this is one that I am very interested in, is the issue of combination of international rules. Again, there are more and more international rules in many different areas of international law. It may be that for the purpose of settling one dispute, you need to combine different rules. And maybe sometimes you don't need to create new rules of international law to settle an issue. You just need to combine what is already existing. Again, I will take the example of climate change, which is, of course, a big issue. What should we do as a matter of international law to fight climate change? One uh, proposal could be to adopt new rules of international, new treaties 
to confront climate change. But it may be, in fact, that we already have what is needed as a matter of international law. And the uh, solution could be, for instance, to combine the Paris Agreement on Climate Change and human rights obligations, or to combine the law of investments, foreign investments, and the Paris Agreement to have more investments, green investments, and less investments in fossil industries. What is important here, I think, is when negotiators or when states want to perhaps propose new rules of international law. Before doing so, I think that today it's important to first assess, evaluate what is already existing and what can be done with the existing rule of international law through interpretation, through identification of the existing obligations or through combination of the existing rule of international. In domestic systems, in domestic legal system, this is the case at least in my country, in France, we have now what we call legal impact assessment, which means that before adopting a new rule of domestic law, we need to evaluate to what extent this rule is really needed to what extent this new rule would impact other rules of the domestic of domestic law. And I think that this process of uh, legal impact assessment, when you propose new negotiations for new rules of international law, should become more systematic in the international sphere to avoid the situations where you spend more, I mean, much time negotiating new rules, which are not necessarily needed, in fact, because we already have enough rules to address some situation. So this was my first point. I think we need to always uh, ask ourselves, do we need more international law or is existing international law sufficient to address some issue? Second question that I want to address this afternoon, um, if we need to create new rules to foster, to strengthen international cooperation, are classical methods of formation of, inter of international law enough, or do we need to create or to invent new forms of international cooperation and new sources of international? For many years, this question was addressed under the heading of what we call soft law. And I think that you all have some ideas on what is soft law, which is uh, informal creation of international law, non-binding international law, uh, etc. Soft law is now a very classical uh, topic of international law. You have a lot of uh, legal literature on the topic, a lot of practice, a lot of debates, uh, uh, etc. And it triggered in the past a lot of fears, a lot of hopes, uh, depending on each one's uh, theoretical views on the topic and each one's political interests. We had lively debates on soft law for, for many, uh, many years. What I want to uh, address this afternoon is the fact that I think my view is that today, soft law uh, 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 arises in a context which is very different from the one when the uh, concept of soft law emerged uh, 40 or 50 years ago. And I will try to explain what are the differences today as compared to the situation which was uh, um, existing 30 or 40 years ago. In the past, and when I say in the past, I want to say in the 20th uh, century, before uh, 1999, so to speak. The debate on soft law arose in a very specific context, which was characterized by three, uh, three uh, main characteristics. First, in 1945, uh, when we uh, started debating soft law, there were at that time not many multilateral treaties. And at that time, soft law was in fact used as a way to explore new areas of international. Soft law was used as a first step, first step 
before concluding treaties, before concluding binding instruments. Take the example of the 1948 UN Declaration on Human Rights. It was a soft law declaration, but it was adopted to explore the field of human rights, and then it led to the conclusions in 1966 of the two covenants on human rights, which are binding treaties. The same process was uh, followed, for instance, years later for the Conventions on Unforced Disappearances, which was first a UN declaration, soft law, and then which was transformed into a binding treaty. The same process occurred for the law of outer space. First declarations of the UN General Assembly in the 60s, and then in 1967, 1972, conclusions on binding treaties on the outer space, the moon, etc. So it was how soft law was used in international law in the 50s, in the 60s. And again, we had the same trend for the protection of the environment, the Stockholm, Rio Declaration, and then treaties. For climate change, first resolutions of the UN General Assembly, then treaties at the universal level. This was how soft law was used. Second characteristic of soft law at that time, Soft law was something which was only known by international lawyers. For domestic lawyers at that time, soft law was a nonsense. Law was binding or it was not law. So it was a debate which was only a debate for international lawyers. And at that time, domestic lawyers were looking at international lawyers as crazy people. What are you doing? Law is binding or is not binding. You have a famous article of a French professor, Prosper Veil, in 1982. It was published in French and then in English at the American Journal of International Law. What Prosper Veil said at that time, that soft law was a sickness for international law. It was not something normal for international law. Again, law is binding or is not law. So soft law were, was debated in that context. And the third characteristic of soft law at that time was that soft law was mainly the weapon of the weak against the strong. It was a weapon for developing countries against the powerful Western states. And this is the reason why at that time, soft law debates were focused on the resolution of the UN General Assembly, where developing states had the majority and were able to adopt text to try to modify international law, which was at that time mainly adopted by powerful Western states. And we can take the example of all the resolutions of the UN General Assembly on the new international economic order, which was a way to have more justice in the international economic system, while treaties adopted at that time, free trade agreements, etc., were not very just for developing countries. So this was a context of soft law uh, in the 60s, 70s, 50s, 60s, 70s, and 80s uh, mainly. Today, today the situation is very different. It's very different for three reasons. First, we now have a great number of multilateral treaties in all areas of international. So the need to use a soft law to explore new areas of international law is less important. This is not today's the main rule of soft law because we already have many binding rules in many areas of international. Second evolution, today soft law is well accepted by any lawyer, including domestic lawyer, including domestic lawyer. In domestic legal system, soft law became something which is quite normal. Uh, I will just take one example, which is again, an example coming from my state, France. Today in France, we have a new case law from the high, highest administrative court, the Conseil d'État. French courts considered that now you can challenge before domestic courts 
not only administrative legal decisions, which are binding, but also any kind of instruments, any kind of guidelines, any kind of text, which has some notable effects, notable effects on the right or situations of people. This is soft law, documents which are notable effects on the right or situation of people. And the Conseil d'État, the highest French court, say that it includes guidelines. You can challenge guidelines before domestic courts now in France. So it means that today for any lawyer, not only international, international lawyer, but also for domestic lawyers, soft law is part of the normal day-to-day -day practice of lawyers. In that context, I think that today, soft law is no longer a theoretical issue, is no longer something which is for academic to discuss. It's part of day-to-day -day practice of international law, and it has become a technical legal issue, not a theoretical issue. It has become a technical legal issue, and the concrete questions that now states are asking to themselves is, how can they resort, uh, how can they practically have recourse to soft law instruments? What are the concrete form of soft law instruments? And what are the possible legal effects of these soft law instruments? And this is a really important part today of the practice of states. And I will take, uh, and I will take three, uh, three examples. The first example, which is not really soft law stricto sensu, but I think it, it's part of the debate on non-binding instruments, is the development of the practice of provisional application of treaties. Provisional application of treaties. Even when a treaty is not in force, which means that a treaty is not yet binding upon states, you have no mechanism for provisional application of the treaty. So states are accepting that a treaty which is not in force will produce some effect provisionally before the entry into force of the treaty. This is a very interesting development of international. And it shows that sometimes because uh, one issue is very urgent, state will accept to be bound even if the treaty itself is not binding for the parties yet. And this practice, which is more and more important, led the International Commission to work on that topic and to adopt in 2021 a set of guidelines on provisional application of treaties. And, and again, if you take a look to this guidance of the LC, there are many examples of uh, treaty provisions providing for provisional application of treaties. And it shows that it's a very important and yet a very complex uh, practice. My second example is general principles of law. General principles of law are a very classical source of international law. You have them in Article 38 of the Statute of the ICJ. And in the mind of the drafters of the Statute of the uh, ICJ, it was binding general principles of law which were covered by Article 38 only binding general principles of law, the principles which create rights and obligations for states. Like, for instance, uh, res judicata, the fact that a decision of a court or tribunal has binding effect for the parties. This is a general principle of law. It creates right and obligation. Today, what we are uh, watching is the uh, emergence of non-binding general principles of law. Or at least there is a debate whether some principles are binding or not binding. And this debate today is again at the agenda of the International Commission with this idea that was uh, accepted by the majority of the members of the Commission in the first reading on the topic that you have two categories of general principles of law. You are the one which are derived from domestic legal system. There is no doubt that these principles are binding. And you have principles derived from the international legal system. Some of these principles are binding, but some of them, I'm not sure that they are binding. 
For instance, some members of the commission invoked under that category of uh, general principles derived from the international legal system, the principle of equity. Is the principle of equity a binding principle of international law or is it only a guiding, a guiding principle of international law, which is not exactly the same thing. This debate was incorporated in a recent treaty adopted uh, by the UN, which I quoted early in this presentation, which is a BBNG agreement, the Agreement on Biodiversity Beyond National Jurisdiction, which was adopted in June, which is a very important for the protection of the high seas. You have in this treaty adopted in June, one provision, which is Article 7. And Article 7 of this treaty is called General Principles and Approaches. General Principles and Approaches. And you have a long list of principles and approaches in this Article 7, uh, which said, Article 7, in order to achieve the objectives of this agreement, Parties shall be guided, shall be guided by the following principle and approaches. So it's not binding as such, it's just guiding principles. And you have, for instance, the polluter pay principle. Not sure that this is a binding principle under customer international. You have the principle of equity and the fair and equitable sharings of benefits. I'm not sure if it is a binding principle under customer international law today, yet it's part of this provision of Article 7. You have also something which is called, I quote, full recognition of the special circumstances of small island developing states. It's a very important uh, point, but I'm not sure that this is binding under international. So this example of non-binding general principle of international law show that today states are willing to have something more than binding instruments to foster international cooperation. There is a need for non-binding or softer instruments. The last example, uh, and I will be quick, is the rise of non-legally uh, binding agreements. Uh, you, you have a recent study from academic in the USA uh, showing that today the United States of America conclude more non-legally binding agreements than treaties. And this is true for many countries. So you have more and more non-binding agreements concluded by states. And of course, we need to assess what are the possible legal effects of these binding agreements. This topic is now at the agenda of the Commission. Let me turn to my third and last point. Third and last point, are there any inequalities today in the formation of international? Is the formation of international democratic enough in the 21st century? And if it's not democratic, uh, what could we do to ensure that international law is fair enough in the process of creating new rules of international? Of course, as a matter of principle, there is no formal inequality in the formation of international. Because as the Permanent Court of Eternal Justice said in 1927 in the Lotus case, you all know the Lotus case, um, there is no rules that you can impose upon states against their will. Okay, so in principle, each state has a word to say when you want to impose some rules to, to these states. So the problem is that in practice, it's not true. In practice, it's not true. In practice, there is no sovereign equality between states in the formation of international. And I will take some examples of this inequality between states. First, you have some institutions like the UN Security Council or the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, where in fact powerful states have more power than other states in the formations of uh, rules and practices under this organization. And uh, this is something which is at the agenda of the international community for many years. How can we reform these institutions, but it's still very difficult uh, to, do, to do it. 
Second example, there is big inequalities between states with regard to human and material resources available uh, for the purpose of negotiation. Uh, when you are France, the UK or the USA, you have a number of people with a lot of financial means to conduct negotiations. It's not true for many countries. So the bargaining power today of states are very unequal in the international sphere. And it has, of course, an impact in the formation of international. The problem is that uh, the, the rules of international law do not take this into, into consideration. There is a very clear example, which is a decision of the ICJ in 1994 in the Libya-Chad Ch territorial dispute, a judgment which was on, on the territorial dispute between Libya and Chad. In that case, one of the state parties of the dispute said that he had no experience in international negotiation. And this lack of experience had to be taken into account by the court when interpreting the treaties, what was agreed by the two states in that case. The court said in that case, no, the lack of experience in negotiation is not a relevant circumstance. I have to be blind as a court with regard to the inequalities in practical terms between states. So this is a very important problem today. And this problem has, again, practical consequences that we face on the day-to-day -day basis in international. And I will take here a few examples. First example, uh, it concerns the ILC. When we work in the ILC on the formation or development of international law, we ask states to provide us with comments on their practice or comments on the text that we adopt. Usually, we only receive responses from 50 or 60 states, 60 states, no more than that. All the other states remain silent on what we are doing. And I presume and I know that, in fact, most, most of these states remain silent because they don't have the means, they don't have the resources to respond to the question of the ILC. It's not that they agree with what the ILC is saying, it's just that they don't have time or resources to present their practice and to react to the product of the commission. This is a very important problem, and this is a problem which is very difficult to resolve because we have to take for granted that one state which remains silence has nothing to say on the topic, which may be not true in fact. The same is true uh, with regard to the interpretation of silence in international case law. I will just take one example, which is a judgment of the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea of 2014, in the Virginia J case, which was a case between Panama and Guinea-Bissau. In that case, the Tribunal for the Law of the Sea said, well, some states adopted regulations, adopted legislations, and I just uh, uh, acknowledge that, in fact, the other states did not react to this practice. They did not react to the practice of the state adopting legislations on this area of international law. I interpret this silence I, as meaning that they do not object to this practice of other states. So silence means no objection. This is a decision of the Tribunal for the Law of the Sea in the Virginia case in 2004. At least the tribunal qualified his statement. It said there is no manifest objection to such legislation. So if there is no manifest objection to the practice of some states, we have to consider that they agree this, with this practice. I'm not sure that this is a correct way to address silence in international law. And again, I think that it has repercussions in terms of equality or inequalities in the process of formation of international law. Just a last example, and we'll finish with that. This is the example of the pending advisory proceedings before the ICJ and the ITLOS on climate change. Uh, before the ITLOS, you had approximately less than 40 states which submit uh, written submissions to the tribunal and participating in the hearings. 
40 states out of 193 states at the UN and 168 state parties to the Convention on the Law of the Sea. This is only a few states which participated in these proceedings, yet their participation will be decisive for the tribunal to decide on this issue on climate change and the law of the sea. I presume that a lot of states did not participate, not because they don't care about the topic or because they do not object with what the other state said, but just because they don't have the means to participate in this kind of procedure. So to me, this is a great challenge for the formation of international law. We, as international lawyers or as diplomats, have to find ways to improve this method of formation of international law and to make the process of formation of international law more inclusive and more democratic in the 31st century. Of course, this is a big challenge. And it shows that, in fact, the formation of international law is not a trivial topic. It's a very important today, a topic today in the 21st century. I will end that. I'm sorry, I may be too long, but I would be very happy to discuss this point with, with you. Many thanks. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Matthias Foto, the dear, dear friend. Um, it's been, I think, an excellent um, uh, and I an eye opener also on what you said, and and I was discussing this with the participants also. You know, normally what it's seen as a, a traditional, classical, not very interesting topic that we teach in first year or second year um, stu to, to first year or second year students, but indeed it carries a lot of um, uh, issues, and 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 I think those last uh, points that you made about um, uh, international law uh, making not being um, democratic enough or inclusive enough are um, extremely um, important and, and in a way um, it is I think uh, part of a wider effort to um, uh, mainstream international law and capacity do capacity building um, in countries that um, um, have uh, less training opportunities um, um, and precisely to promote uh, more participation that this academy uh, was um, uh, was created. So certainly those last points really resonate um, uh, with with us as, as uh, uh, directors of the academy and and uh, and I'm sure with many participants because I think one point, that you didn't mention when you, and we've discussed this a lot in the ILC and how to improve it, uh, when you said that uh, there's very limited participation um, and interaction with states um, when the ILC is preparing um, uh, what then can become uh, uh, conventions, but also in producing alternative products that may be called soft law or something like conclusions or guidelines. Um, that the participation not only is very limited, but it's from certain number of states uh, that usually are very active in the international arena, mostly European states um, and some Latin America, uh, very few Africans, very few Asians. So I think that's also, I mean, it's important to stress that point because it's, uh, if we look at the list of uh, the states that usually contribute to the ILC work, they are more or less from the same regions and more or less the same states. And, and certainly Africa is very absent and, uh, and most of Asia is also very absent. And so given the participants that we have, I think that's also a very uh, important point to, uh, to stress. So let me open the floor. We have about 10 minutes for, for questions. I, I wonder first if I, I see that there's two questions in the Q&A box, but uh, I wanted also to give the opportunity if uh, there's any participant that wants to ask a, a live um, question, um, if you would like to uh, turn on your mic um, and, and ask for the floor. I'm trying to monitor uh, to see if there's any raised hands. Um, yes. yes, I see. Thank you, Professor Patricia. Yes, yes. Yeah, please. may I have a floor? Yes, please. Okay. Uh, Thank you so much, Professor Patricia, uh, Professor Matthias Fortu. Uh, very encouraging and uh, refreshing about the topic of international law today. It's, it's very challenging time to talk about international law. Uh, I would like to uh, give some comments regarding uh, what mentioned by Professor Matthias. Uh, 
uh, this is really true that uh, but perhaps we, are, we should think about uh, how equality of state in term in front of the international is a big question. But then we know that uh, um, uh, all states countries now become more aware how important the international. I think this is the time also people know that in, uh, uh, the international is very important during these uh, global times. So without international, I think uh, we can see that there will be some uh, big problem how to manage countries uh, in the world, whether in the United Nations or any other uh, international organization. Uh, for, for sure, I would like to uh, uh, mention about how important of the international in the context of uh, WTO. People know and understand where that uh, WTO is one of the uh, strategic uh, important international organization during this uh, globalization uh, time. Uh, I think uh, there's no one country uh, have an, ob an objection about role and function of the WTO as an uh, organization of uh, World Trade Organization. So the uh, WTO is becoming the more strategic uh, international uh, uh, institution to perform and to implement all the rules of international trade. So inter, uh, uh, rule of interna uh, international rules of trade are becoming more encouraging. People, all countries are talking about the role and function, uh, the strategic roles of WTO. So this is the, uh, the so that's, uh, there is a need. Uh, there's, I can say that all countries uh, 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 collectively, I can say like that, uh, the need and uh, the importance of existing of the WTO. Because without WTO, we're talking about international in terms of uh, freedom of trade, about the international trade, uh, will be a big problem in harmonizing all countries to, uh, uh, to uh, increase, uh, in, increase their trade uh, in international with, with other countries. So that is the point that uh, I can say that nowadays all countries uh, uh, feel that. Uh, this is the time the international is very important. We are not talking about anymore about the, whether it is, is international is low, whether there is international law or not. This is, it is uh, no more. It's no longer uh, appropriate to talk about the existing of international. The fact international is exist, all countries need international law, and all countries have to uphold the rules uh, of international law. So that's the important things. And the sample of that is what the implementation of the WTO law. It's the real fact of part of the international law. So WTO is the, um, what's called the, um, the mirror, the mirror of the uh, implementation of the rules of in, rules in international. Uh, that is the point I would like to say. Thank you so much, Professor Metis, for your uh, excellent presentation. Professor uh, Patricia, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Ahmad. And, uh... Let me then try to manage this. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll take just a couple more questions. Uh, one I wanted to, you know, bring from the chat um, uh, because there's uh, to balance a bit <laughs> those that may be more timid or in, in not in a position to turn their cameras on. So there was a question in the chat about whether you register soft law because uh, we yesterday in our lecture, we spoke about the registration of treaties. So there's a question about registration of soft law. Uh, which is, I mean, interesting also because it brings um, a question about the publicity also uh, of um, of soft law, which is sometimes a question, and we'll deal with that tomorrow also. So that question, um, and also we have, um, uh, let me see the different hands. Uh, Lorraine from the Philippines, uh, if you want to ask your question, please. Yes, thank you, Professor. In the interest of time, I'll try to make my question or point um, shorter. I have just three um, points to raise. First, regarding, um, Professor, what you mentioned about do we still need more um, international law? And I would like to, uh, I mean, I agree with the Professor that, you know, 
there's there's still need for certain issues because I think that as we the international scene progresses, there are issues that you know arise that are different from before. So aside from combining existing international laws, I believe that some of the international laws that are already existing should be updated already in the interest of the new um, issues that are arising nowadays. Um, and then uh, it's so it's really more of an opinion. And then I would like to ask your opinion, Professor, on two points. First, on in inclusivity. You mentioned in your last point that you know um, there's a question or, or there's a challenge in terms of democracy in creating international law. I would like to ask um, because in the international law we have to accept the fact that you know there are um, developed countries and there are developing countries and certain issues in the developing countries are not really that urgent or that not really pressing for developing countries such as like the Philippines and so I would like to ask what could what is your opinion on how do we make international law more inclusive in terms of balance of having a balancing act on you know what is more pressing for developing countries compared to that in developed countries and then my second question is more on the question of compliance in terms of whether when there's dispute in the implementation of international law because you mentioned about you know there's a question uh, in terms of compliance countries would actually concur in in certain uh, international instruments but there's a question as whether whether or not they would comply because of clarity of their um, you know roles roles in terms of th those treaties but um, there's another aspect i believe in terms of you know we know already our roles but what if there's a dispute between the um between the countries involved and then they will be subjected into say for example a tribunal but then again you know at the end of the day in the international relations compliance so it is really more on whether or not i would actually subscribe to that particular ruling or i would subscribe to what would be the judgment on that particular dispute so um i would like to ask you professor what do you think would be the best way to encourage parties in terms of compliance whenever there's a dispute involving a particular international instrument thank you thank you professors Thank you very much. So we have this uh, three uh, questions. Um, I see that there's still a number of questions popping up in the Q&A and a number of uh, raised hands, but unfortunately we will not have time to address them all. But uh, uh, please feel free to, um, for those who have not yet put their questions on the chat or question or Q&A to do so. Um, and also uh, by email, uh, because we can try to address them um, after the lecture, but we will we'll take this uh, uh, three questions and, and give Professor Forto the opportunity to reply and then we'll, we will have to close. Uh, so please, Matthias. Thank you, Patricia. So we'll take them in the order, chronological order. So we forgot to the question of Mr. Saleh from Indonesia on WTO. I think it was rather a common than a question, but I think the example of the WTO is very important because it shows that it's not very easy to address this challenge of equality inequalities because in some instances, you may say that consensus is good because it, protect, it protects every state. But in other instances, consensus, consensus could be very bad because it paralyzes the negotiations. So uh, we need to find ways to be at the same time inclusive, but at the same time efficient. And this is this balance, which is, I think, at the heart of the formation of international law today, to be sure that anyone can participate and we have, will have a word to say, but at the same time, that consensus is not a way to block negotiations. And the example of a WTO is a very good example. It works, it worked very well for many years, but today I think it doesn't work anymore because of consensus. So it's, it's a very good, good I think, uh, example. Um, on the question of Mr. Ajema from Ethiopia on registration, uh, the answer is clear. There is no obligation to register non-binding agreements. And in fact, if you try to do it, the UN will tell you, no, 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 it's not a treaty. So we don't, we cannot put this into the UN uh, treaty series of uh, treaties. So the obligation in the UN Charter is only to register binding treaties. And there is a, a, a control which is made by the uh, UN uh, treaty section on, on that point. And there are very clear rules on the dis distinction between treaties and non-binding agreements. The issue of publicity is different, but it's a very complicated issue because 
since they are non-binding agreements, uh, um, it's they are not governed in principle by international law, but you may say that one party is prohibited to publish this agreement if the other party doesn't want to publish this agreement. So it may be that in fact, the publicity of the non-binding agreement is governed in part by, or governed in part by international. Uh, what is true if you take a look to the practice is that you have a great number of secret non-binding agreements. And this is part of the practice. Uh, so there is no strict rule on publicity or non-publicity of, of these binding agreements. On the last question of uh, Ms. Lauren from Philippines, uh, with regard to inclusivity, uh, it's a, of, of course, it's a very wide question, so I cannot address it in very uh, detail, detail here. I think what is very important to me as international lawyer is to try to develop more uh, the practice of model clauses, uh, model provisions. Because I think to enhance the bargaining power of developing countries in important negotiations like international economic negotiations, trade negotiations, uh, protection of foreign investment uh, uh, negotiations, to be uh, powerful in the negotiations, you need to have sometimes work done by other, like model clauses, and then you can use this toolbox during the negotiations. And this is something that the UN could be more productive on, to propose model clauses with commentaries of these clauses, then to allow these states to be more powerful uh, during negotiations. So this is one proposal among, of, of course, many others. Uh, we forgot to compliance. So your question was rather about uh, the settlement of disputes, which is a different topic than the formation of international law. But I think there is a, a very important link between uh, um, settlement of disputes, compliance on the one hand, and formation of international law. And this is something which was dealt with by a very interesting paper from New York University, which shows that for many countries nowadays, you have too many obligations, too many legal rules of international law. And when you have too many obligations, it has an impact on compliance because you don't have the means, the resources to comply with all these international obligations at the same time. Uh, this is all the more true if you have linguistic issues. Uh, if your language in your domestic system is not one of the six languages of the UN, then you have problems in application of treaties which are not even translated in your own language. So I think that on this issue, uh, the less must be, uh, in fact, better than, than the more. If you have less obligations, it's better for compliance. If you have too many obligations, sometimes it's not always good for compliance with international law. So again, this is the idea that we have to assess before adopting new rules if these new rules would be a good opportunity or will have detrimental effect on the um, international cooperation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matthias. And uh, I think it's time for us to wrap up. And I want to thank you for your very interesting, thought-provoking uh, lecture, very complementary to what we were discussing yesterday and uh, that we'll, to what we will discuss um, uh, tomorrow. So we'll come back uh, to many of the questions that were raised. And thank you also to the participants for their active uh, participation. Uh, before we close, I just want to give the floor to Nilifer, who's uh, with us, my very dear co-director of the Academy, uh, also to do some uh, some closing words since she's uh, with us. Please, Nilifer. Thank you. Thank you, dear Patricia. And greetings to all of you. Uh, I'm sorry I could only join you late, uh, but it's a pleasure to have all of you joining us in this fourth year of the CILE Academy. And a very warm welcome to Mateus, our dear friend and colleague. And I had the pleasure of listening to your lecture. And it was, as to be expected from, from Mateus, uh, excellent and, of course, thought provoking as well. And I think that we could easily go on discussing this. I have some questions and comments as well, but I think we will have to have perhaps a part two. Um, so dear Patricia, and thank you so much um, for uh, taking the lead as co-director and for your lecture as well. And it's really a great pleasure for the CILE Academy uh, to be in session once more. And I look forward to seeing the rest of the participants uh, 
tomorrow, next week, and thereafter. So greetings to all. And again, thank you, dear Matthias. And I guess Matthias, we call please, it a day. Just want that, <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> thank you to you for this invitation. It was a great pleasure again to be here, and uh, and we can continue this section of views by mail with uh, with a lot of pleasure. Yeah, Wonderful. Thank you so much for your availability, Matthias, and uh, for your generosity with your time, which is uh, we know it's very busy. So um, I, I am again a warm, warm thanks from our part and. Uh, for the participants, we meet again tomorrow at the same time, same place. Um, and Matthias, uh, looking forward to seeing you again soon. And uh, uh, thanks to everyone. Bye bye. Thank you, Professor Patricia. Thank you, Professor Matthias. Bye bye.